Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, much for joining us this afternoon, despite the snow slash sleet, hail, rain, whatever it really is, uh, as we welcome uh, the Right Honourable Sir John Major, KGCH, for an address and Q&A. Sir John is a Conservative and Unionist politician who served as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1990 to 1997, having previously served as Foreign Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer. Sir John led the Conservative Party to a surprise victory in the 1992 general election, winning a majority and receiving over 14 million votes, still a record figure in British political history. Sir John is going to give some opening remarks before taking questions from me and then from the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sir John Major. Well, uh, thank you, Charlie, and congratulations to all of you for surviving the weather and actually being here. It was uh, something we did wonder about. Some 30-odd uh, years ago, I was walking in the Kremlin with uh, Boris Yeltsin, who was then the president of Russia. And I said to him, Boris, tell me, in one word, what is the state of Russia? He said, good. I was surprised it was falling apart at the time. I said, tell me in two words. He said, not good. <laughs> and today, there's a lot of good in our world, but also, if I can use Yeltsin speak, a lot of not good as well. Some 30 years or so ago, we glimpsed, briefly, a better world. The Soviet Union imploded, Germany reunited. Apartheid ended, democracy spread right across Eastern Europe. The liberal order was dominant, and even China was opening its doors. It looked, it looked in that shining hour, as though the values of democracy, of freedom of thought and deed, had won the battle of ideas. It was a time of hope. In many ways since then, there have been huge improvements. But we were wrong about the advance of democracy. One generation later, Authoritarian regimes remain widespread. Less than 10% of the world actually live in what we might really call a true and full democracy. And a further 30% or so in flawed democracies. The rest live in worse conditions. Political and civil liberties are under attack as democracy falls back. And if you should sit there and think, well, that's a problem for others. I'm in the UK. Ponder this. All Europe, including us, face a migrant crisis. And other mi migrants, some of whom risk their lives in the most terrible ways in order to get here, are they fleeing from democratic countries or from autocratic countries? You know the answer to that. But the problem is exported from there to other countries right around Europe including us. And even as we meet, peace isn't a given. Think of Iraq, or Syria, or Yemen, or Afghanistan, or of course, Ukraine. And worryingly, even the two great powers, America and China, are now growing apart, reversing nearly five decades of diplomacy. So what went wrong? We took democracy for granted. We forgot to continue to promote it. We thought the job was done and it wasn't. The world needs democracy to thrive and to grow because where it fails to do so, people can easily fall under the spell not of leaders, but of misleaders. And we should beware. Misleaders deliver populism, laced with fiction and flavored with intolerance. Populist leaders are self-interested. They prefer obedience to ability. Acolytes are rewarded and promoted. Dissenters are abused and crushed. The electorate is misled and the media is duped. Populism makes promises that can never be kept. It creates division. It scapegoats minorities. It controls or undermines, if it can't control, the law itself. 
that is often the route towards autocracy. And the right to vote, so heavily trumpeted in some countries, is confusing. The right to vote is often the fig leaf. On its own, the right to vote is not democracy. The vote can be corrupted. In China, Russia, Iran, and many other countries, voting exists, but democracy most emphatically does not. In Europe, Hungary and Poland vote, but civil freedoms continue to decline, as they do in countries where we had hoped for better, Turkey being an obvious example. If democracy is to spread, it needs to demonstrate its merits, greater individual freedom, and hopefully higher living standards as well. And without that, democracy can be overwhelmed, value by value, freedom by freedom, country by country. When I talk of freedom, I don't only mean to be at liberty. I mean to be truly free, free of war, free of fear, ideally free of want. I mean a judicial system free of political direction. I mean freedom to worship without persecution and within the law to be free to speak and act against injustice or oppression. Without such freedoms, lives are diminished. And that is the world we live in for more than 50% of the people who live in that world. Since the uh, financial crash of 2007 to 8, oddly there's confusion as to which year it really started. But since that financial crash, tens of millions of people in many countries have faced a hardship they didn't expect and certainly did not deserve. It's no surprise that this has caused discontent even in our own country here in the UK. If the pre-crash trend of growth had continued, the average Briton would be 40% better off. But they are not. And the economic standstill has brought to the fore a level of inequality and opportunity and lifestyle that has grown up over many decades and should no longer be accepted or ignored. If lifestyles improve only for the few and not for the many, then something has gone seriously wrong. And that something needs action to put it right. It can't be easy. It won't be quick. Our economy at the moment faces acute problems. Some of them are long term, such as dismal productivity. Productivity is one quarter of what it was to take a time at random the mid-90s. Other problems are beyond our control, such as COVID and the war in Ukraine. Yet more are self-inflicted. Economic success isn't just an abstract concept for economists and others. Consider what it really means for the everyday person. Without growth, there are fewer tax receipts, there are poorer public services. There is lower public pay and higher taxes for everyone in work. And all of those individually and collectively reduce the quality of life for everyone. For some, it produces real hardship. I must say to you, I never believe that here, in our own United Kingdom, we would see working men and women having to resort to food banks in what is the fifth or sixth richest nation across the world. But that is what we're seeing now. It's why as the economy grows again, and of course it will do so, as the economy grows again, we, we will find it necessary to reverse that hardship and improve equality. So levelling up, if I may use the slogan, and it's the only one I promise you will pass my lips tonight, I hate the wretched things. Levelling up must be a duty and not just a slogan. But levelling up is also an extraordinary political opportunity. For 70 years, the Labour Party, and quite rightly in my view, had benefited from setting up the National Health Service. And in many ways, it has defined them 
throughout a large part of their life. Leveling up is a task of similar scale. There's no quick fix. It can't be done between now and the election, or during the next parliament, or the parliament after that. This is a job for a generation, and perhaps longer. Sometimes in public life, an inflection point is reached where a reset is needed. I do believe we are now reaching just such a point. But what does reset mean? It means change. It means delving into problems that have been pushed to one side, growing slowly, but they suddenly reach a point at which action is absolutely necessary. Whether it may be in our great services like education or health, or in any other part of our lives. But if we are going to reset, the first thing we must do is to see ourselves as we really are and not as once we were. In 1900, we were a mighty power, a mighty power in a world of two billion people. Today, that world has eight billion people, 8,000 million people, of which only a mere 70 million are Britons. Our population today is dwarfed by that of the rest of the world. And our economy dwindles in comparison to growth in the rest of the world as the large nations industrialize and become more economically powerful. Now, I don't say this to disparage our country or its efforts, but merely for this reason, to put us into context because for too many people, nostalgia and national pride gives us a false impression of what we are and where we stand in this modern world. Today, there are three superpowers, and we are not one of them. We are an upper-ranking middle power. We matter, but the world no longer revolves around us as once we had every reason to believe that it did. For decades, we flattered ourselves. We flattered ourselves that we punched above our weight. And that was true. But at that time, we were a close partner to two of the three great powers, the United States and the European Union. That has now changed. We are no longer so cosily placed with the United States and in a referendum we chose, or to be strictly accurate, 37% of our nation chose to leave the European Union. The world now sees us as less influential. Brexit is a controversial subject, but it isn't a subject we can ignore because the impact of what we have done continues and will continue on into the future for a long time. Brexit, in my view, is the most divisive and the most damaging political decision of my lifetime. It divided the nations of the United Kingdom, one against another, or to be more strictly accurate, two against two. It divided politics in the middle of parties and between parties. It divided friends, it divided families. It divided the United Kingdom from many of its near friends across the Channel and elsewhere. All that division, so important. And yet, in our land of free speech, Brexit seems to be a forbidden subject for politicians. The Brexiteers would like it parked silently in a corner, rather like an embarrassing relative at a family gathering. They tell us we must just move on, but we can't, and we shouldn't. We need to repair the damage that has been done. The government talks of Brexit only in slogans and aspirations, which is probably wise, as most of its promises have not been met. The Labour Party talks only of making Brexit work, the clearest possible indication that it isn't yet doing so. But we can't ignore it. In leaving the European Union, we lost full access 
to the richest free trade market that history has ever known. Business with our nearest neighbours has seriously declined. So has investment from them. Year after year, we are losing growth. During the referendum, anti-immigration dog whistles were deployed in order to win votes. Brexit leaders demanded, I quote, control of our borders, a euphemism for keeping immigrants out. We were told that tens of millions of Turks, <coughs> tens of millions of Turks would flood into the UK if we stayed in Europe, which of course, had it happened, would have left Turkey almost completely empty. Such oratory betrayed our values as well as our interests. But the dog whistles worked. European workers heard the message, felt unwanted, and returned home. We now have a labor and skill shortage. So the truth to be faced, and there is no ducking it, the truth to be faced is Brexit has made the United Kingdom poorer, weaker, and less respected, while the promised benefits of Brexit fade ever further into the future. Meanwhile, our country waits and hopes that something, anything, will turn up. It's a bit like the play Waking for Godot. Uh, but if I remember rightly in that play, Godot never arrives. Today, seven years on from the referendum, no one, no one is able to tell us in any detail what these Brexit benefits are or when they will become apparent. The case for Europe is not only trade, cash, and economic well-being, or even mainly that. The impetus to build Europe was so that European nations would never again go to war with one another, as twice they did in the last century. And for that prize, every nation was prepared to make sacrifices, even to the extent of sharing sovereignty. It was a noble objective, and it still is. As I look ahead, I hope my country, my children, and my grandchildren will be safe and secure in what may be a very uncertain world. I believe they'll have greater opportunities and be less vulnerable if they are inside one of the great power blocks of the world rather than outside. It isn't credible, not politically practical, not credible to rejoin the European Union at the moment. Certainly we could not do so on the favorable terms we previously enjoyed because they will not be an offer. We casually threw those away. Were we to renegotiate, we would probably have to commit to joining the euro currency, which would be very difficult for many reasons, and possibly to accept common European debt, which would be absolute anathema to the Treasury. They would close their doors and feel distinctly sick were that to happen. Nor is it even certain that the European Union would not reject us as a disruptive force were we to rejoin. But if not inside the European Union, we can and must get closer. The agreement on the Northern Ireland Protocol is a welcome move forward, and I warmly congratulate the Prime Minister on achieving it. He's right, absolutely right, to tell us how fortunate Northern Ireland is to be in the UK and the European single market. I agree. I just regret that the whole of the United Kingdom isn't in exactly the same favorable position. But if if we are ever to rejoin, it may not be until a younger, more pro-European generation comes to political power. And even then, it can't be certain, for we neither know how Europe will change in the interim, nor how we will in our own country. Our politics is not in a good place. Too often, the loudest voices prevail and the most profound thinkers do not. 
Labour are clear favourites at the moment to win the next general election. But this is uh, far from a done deal. They had huge poll leads in 1990, very similar to now, but they lost in 1992. Nothing is certain, as millions of voters still shy away from Labour's left wing. As for the Conservative Party, they are hamstrung by threats and dissent from ultras within their own right wing. It's ironic, isn't it? In the mother of parliaments that the whole world has copied and praised for generations, in the mother of parliaments that both the main political parties can be held hostage by the views of their own most ideological members of parliament. Time and again in the Commons, we see how a minority group within a group can make good government almost impossible. It is a tragedy that both our principal party leaders have to spend their time appeasing the unappeasable. Of course, in politics, there must be room for legitimate dissent, but there is nothing democratic about national policy becoming a playground for the ideologically obsessed. If the mainstream middle of politics allows itself to be sidelined by the extremes, it leaves ultra-Tories and ultra-socialists better able to frustrate sensible policy that is good for our future. It is way past time for majority opinion in Parliament to assert itself more vigorously. A reset of policy that I spoke of a few moments ago is a challenge that will far outrun this generation of politicians. Task is huge, but the choice is simple. We reform or we fall behind. And lest we forget, we ask a lot of government, which is not easy to achieve. But what of governments? What should we expect of them? Governments must be powerful enough to defend the country from attack, to keep in place a fair system of justice, and to protect and enhance the legacy of the next generation. It must be strong enough to keep the rich and influential in order, and ensure that the poor are helped and protected. Government must not be able to ignore inequity. It must not be able to override common decency nor the conventions of good government without which we would need a written constitution. It must not be exempt from the law, nor a stranger to the truth. And in our democracy, no government must be over mighty. As you can see, it is a fine line to walk. To maximize success, we need the most able men and women in positions of leadership in and beyond power. We need Parliament, stuffed full of the best people we can get there, even though it's an unfashionable career. I dare say if I ask you to raise your hands if you're interested in a parliamentary career, there would be far fewer hands raised than would have been when I was here 20 years ago. But I would hope that some of you here this evening will be among those future leaders we need. For events may demand that it falls to your generation to reshape the political landscape. And as you leave these hallowed walls, what sort of world will you enter? You'll enter a world at the moment of great division, but also of great opportunity and extraordinary change. A world of great competition and rich rewards, and I don't only mean financially when I say that. A world in which almost no ambition is too far-fetched to be achievable. It's a world of problems in search of solutions. A world in which the greater your ability, the greater will be your obligation to your country and to others. It will be a world of good intentions, often frustrated. A world of good and bad people, of the fortunate and the tragic. You will see in your lifetime things your parents never dreamed of, and you may live in a way that they never could have imagined. Throughout our history, 
The future has been called upon to improve the legacy of the past, generation upon generation. It will always be so. Today, upon you and your contemporaries, a great deal depends. You and your generation will have the power to change things for the better. I profoundly hope you seize that opportunity and use it wisely. Thank you very much.